you. Good morning. Good morning. Is anybody out there? It's great to be with you this morning and um, to be able to talk to you about some things that have changed my life and I hope you will find as significant in yours. Um, several years ago, I came across the story of a young 19-year-old Ukrainian girl and she was in trouble. She had a very sick mother and her father was an um, unemployed alcoholic. She had two younger sisters she needed to support. Her name was Marika, and she found that there was an opportunity for a waitressing job in Tel Aviv. She went and applied, and despite her reservations, was reassured this was on the up and up, and so she took the job. It proved to be a hoax of un from home without a passport in the clutches of uh, traffickers who brutalized her into this industry. She said on the first day, she was forced to service eight men. Over the next four months, she said she lost count. It wasn't the first time I'd heard about sex trafficking but it was the first time a name and a face had been put on that story. And I was horrified. At the same time, I was doing research for a book project, the book that I've just released, entitled Half the Church, Recapturing God's Global Vision for Women. And I was doing this research um, very focused on questions that had surfaced in my own story and that I was seeing were surfacing in the lives of other women. If you had asked me at the time if Marika had anything to do with what I was working on, I would have answered with a bewildered no. If you asked me that same question today, I would give you a very different answer. Now, I have to admit that the questions that I was asking were, in the beginning, very personal. I was very focused on my own story. Um, in the years, for me, after college, it was like the bottom dropped out of my life. Um, I had been raised in a very traditional Christian family, and the vision that I was given of my life and where I would find my fulfillment as a Christian woman, as a woman, was in marriage and motherhood. But instead of finding this right person who was supposed to change my life and help me find fulfillment, I entered a 10-year span of singleness. And I couldn't find a job that was suitable for me, that was satisfying in any way. When I married, I had um, another battle to fight, and that was the battle with infertility. And I, it proved for me to be a losing battle. And so I'm looking at my story and I'm thinking, am I missing what God created me to be? Is it possible that I could lose his purpose? That it could be taken from me? That I could spoil it or be cheated of it? I wanted to know, is the message of the Bible for me as a woman something that's going to hold up under the contingencies that I face in my own story? And then I began to hear what other women were asking about their lives when sickness or a broken marriage or a disappointment and a loss of some kind, some grief um, or some challenge that they failed at um, caused them to feel like they were losing their purpose. And um, these questions for me began to expand. And I found that I wasn't alone, that I was looking at young women who weren't married yet, and they were thinking that God's purposes for them were somewhere down the road, but not now. And elderly women who feel that God's purposes for them has, have expired. And I wanted to know, do God's purposes for us as women cover the entire span of a woman's lifetime? No matter where she goes, no matter what season she's in, no matter what her life looks like or how it's playing out. 
And I wanted to know, are the purposes of God for women robust enough to survive the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century? 9-11 was a big time of change. And that's when we began to see images like this on our television screens. And I began to realize that the West isn't all there is to the world and that these questions that I was asking needed to be much bigger because these women need to be addressed by the purposes of God that are presented to us in Scripture. And as I looked at the landscape of the 21st century, I realized that we live in a world of extremes. We live in a world of utter powerlessness, as we've heard with this whole idea of sex trafficking. But women who aren't even allowed to show their faces in public. And at the other end, we have women who are in positions of enormous power and influence in world affairs. They're running countries. They are ambassadors representing their, their nations in the United Nations and setting the agenda for, for world events that are happening. And there are many voices that are speaking into women's lives. And I wanted to know what is the message that the Bible is speaking into women's lives. These questions that I'm asking are personal, but they're global. They're global too. And unless we have this conversation in a global arena, we can't be sure we have the right answers or even that we're asking the right questions. We need the help of women who understand the world, the culture in which the Bible emerged, so that they can help us even understand our own Bibles. But the questions I was asking were not just personal, not just global, but they're also kingdom questions. Because if I don't understand my purpose, if none of us understand truly what our purpose is, the purpose that God has created us to fulfill, the kingdom of God is going to suffer in our day. And so these questions drove me back to the Genesis narrative where God is casting his vision for the world, casting his vision for men and women. And the questions that I'm asking are answered there in the vision that, that God has defined in the words that he speaks for his daughters. And let me just say that although I'm asking questions for women, the questions I'm asking for women are vitally important to men. This is not a sidebar that you don't need to pay attention to because the answers that we give for women are going to impact your life in many, many ways. There are three things that God tells us in the Genesis creation narrative that explain to us what his vision is for us as, his, as men and women. The first thing that God says about us is the most important thing any man or woman can know about themselves. And that is when God says, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The earth should shake when we speak those words. And yet we've gotten so familiar with them that the shock of what God is doing here has completely worn off. And we read in systematic theologies that, that we're different from plants and animals because we inherit certain qualities from God that make us a higher life form. And that because we are God's image bearers, we have reason and morality and love and wisdom and justice. That we are spiritual beings. That we have a capacity for relationship. That God has invested every human being with value and purpose and dignity and equality. But that barely scratches the surface of what God has done when he creates male and female to be his image bearers. When God created us to be his image bearers, he created us to be reflections of who he is. The world proclaims the glory of God, but nowhere should the, the, should the revelation of God on earth be clearer than it is in us. And this means that before a single human being set foot on the planet, God made it absolutely essential for each one of us to have a relationship with him. We won't know who we are why we're here or what our purpose is in life if we don't know the God who created us. And it means that our purpose in life is to know him. 
that we need to know him. We need to study him. We need to find out what he loves. We need to learn to see our world through his eyes, to love what he loves, to be passionate about what he is passionate about, and to join his cause. It means that he has created us to do his work on earth, to be the ones who are looking after things on his behalf. God put us here to take care of things. This is the highest calling any human being can have. You are called to be like God. It means that you have an identity that is grounded in an unchanging God, and so nothing that happens in your life or your circumstances can ever take your identity away from you. I wanted to know how to be an image bearer, and I think we learned this from Hollywood. These are image bearers. You know, they're given a character that they are to portray. And these two, Helen Mirren and Jamie Foxx, won the Oscar for their performance. Their performance didn't come naturally. It came from hard work. And yes, they're talented actors, but in order to pull off what they did in these performances, they had to study the person they were to portray. They had to study everything about that person, how they talked, how they held their head, how they moved, the inflections in their voices, how they looked and dressed. Every detail mattered. And what they saw, they practiced over and over and over again until they mastered the portrayal of Queen Elizabeth II and Ray Charles. And that's what we are called to do with God, and we have Jesus to study. We are to study him. We are to find out how he interacted with people, what he did in his life, what kind of character he displayed. And we are to imitate what we see in him. That's the first thing. We are called and created to be God's image bearers, to reflect him to the world. And we are called to be in pursuit of the Oscar. But the second thing is when in Genesis chapter 2, the biblical camera zooms in on the creation of male and female. And often this is talked about as creation of marriage. The implications for marriage are explained at the end of the passage. But this is creation of male and female. So it applies to all of us. And God looks at the man he has created and he says these words, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper. The Hebrew word is azer, suitable for him. This word azer has become the word that gets discussed and debated in Christian circles. It's usually translated helper. Now, I have to say that when God looked at the man, there was nothing wrong with the man. The man is a masterpiece. The creation of male and female are at the climax of God's creative activity. So God isn't looking at the man and saying, oh, there's something terribly wrong with him and he can't function properly or take care of himself. And this is where we start making jokes about men and women. But the Bible doesn't make jokes of men and women. It holds them in the highest regard. So God isn't saying the man is helpless. God is saying something really significant and in informing us about our relationships when he says it's not good for the man to be alone and what he needs is an azer. What scholars do to understand a Hebrew word like this is they do an inventory. And in this word, the use of the word azer as a noun, they did the inventory. Found that the word was used 21 times in the Old Testament. It's used twice in Genesis for the woman. Three times it's used for nations that Israel is appealing to for military aid when they're under attack. And the remaining 16 times it's used for God as the helper of his people. Well, that meant that helper needed to be upgraded to strong helper. And so that's what they did. And then they began to argue about what do we mean by strong? Is she, you know, does this change her rank with respect to the man? And this debate went on and on. What I did when I was studying this 
was I went and looked up all the passages, all those 21 passages where the word azer appears. And I discovered a pattern that began to emerge. And that was that the word azer always appears in a military context. Three nations, Israel wants military aid sent because they have a battle to fight and they need military aid to help them fight this battle. In the usages for God, it says that he is our shield and defense. He's better than chariots and horses. He stands sentry watch over his people. And every single passage, it, there were these military references. And I happen to know at the time that there are other places in Scripture where women are referred to with military language. The Proverbs 31 woman is a woman of valor. And there's military language all through that passage. Paul calls women along with men to arm themselves with the full armor of God and to stand against the enemy. So I go back to the Genesis narrative and I'm thinking, you know, we talk about Eden as paradise, but Eden is a war zone. There's an enemy getting ready to make an attack. God told the man and the woman to rule and subdue, which means they're going to face opposition. And he commands the man to guard the garden. It's the same language used for the angel after they're evicted to guard the, who guards the garden with a sword. And I concluded from that that the Azer is a warrior. That the battle that man is called to face and the kingdom he's called to advance in this world requires the help of a strong warrior at his side. Not because he's weak, but because the battle is great. And that this is what God has done in bringing men and women together. So, a woman is God's image bearer and she's an Azer warrior that the man needs. It's not good for him to be without her in any sphere. The third thing comes again in chapter 1 when God creates male and female, and it says that he blessed them. And then he spreads this global mission before them, the whole earth, where they are to be fruitful and increase in number to fill the earth and to subdue it. They are the ones, they are his A-team to advance his kingdom. God is entrusting his mission on earth to male and female. Every dimension of life on earth is where they are together to advance his purposes. We don't typically think like this. We often, in Christian circles especially, have men working with men and women working with women. But that is not the way God set things up to be. He means for male and female to partner together for his kingdom. They are his A-team. The history of men and women working together is longer than men working with men or women working with women. And somehow, in some way, as this blessed alliance of male and female comes together, God's image shines more brightly in the world than in any other way. These are physical and, th and theological callings that God has called us to in this world, not just to reproduce physically, but to reproduce spiritually to reproduce image bearers of the living God and to live fruitful, productive lives as we steward and care for the earth's resources. I like to think of it in terms of a construction project. And if you've ever been involved in or heard about home renovations, you know that one of the first things that somebody does when they go in to remodel is to find out where are the load-bearing walls. Because if you mess with a load-bearing wall, you're going to bring the whole structure down. And when I read Genesis, I think that God created a world with a kingdom that is to be built on two load-bearing walls. The first load-bearing wall is the relationship between the creator and his image bearers. This is our lifeline. We cannot be who God has created us to be or live as he means for us to live in this world if we don't know the God who made us. 
But the second load-bearing wall is the relationship between men and women, which God created to be a blessed alliance. It is from this strong center where we are centered on God and joined together in that relationship that we move out in strength to do the work that he has called us to do in his world. If what I'm saying is true, then what the enemy did in the garden was beyond brilliant. In a single blow, the enemy brought down the two load-bearing walls, the twin towers of God's kingdom strategy collapsed on, the, on that day in Eden. God's image bearers were cut off from their creator. And the blessed alliance was broken up as men and women were divided from one another. And instead of this strong alliance, we have instead the battle of the sexes. But God has never abandoned his vision for the world. He has never abandoned his vision for us. He has never abandoned his dream for this world or his plans for a kingdom that would honor his name and reflect what happens in heaven. Jesus came to restore both load-bearing walls for Jesus is the one who reconnects us with our Creator. And He is the one who joins men and women back into this blessed alliance. He joins us in a richly diverse male female unity into one body, where both halves of the body need to function at 100% capacity. The body of Christ is strong because we are one together and because each one of us is bringing all of the gifts and all of the resources and all of the privileges that he has entrusted to us to this one goal of building his kingdom on earth. We are called to be the ones who are advancing God's kingdom on earth. One of the reasons I love talking about this with college students is that I wish someone had told me these things when I was sitting where you are today. I didn't know that God expected so much of me. This changes everything for us. More than reassuring us that we matter, that we have purpose, that our identity is rock solid, that our lives do count. These callings come with heavy responsibilities. Heavy responsibility for how we represent God in this world. We are his eyes, his ears, his voice, his hands. We are the ones who are speaking and acting for him. How are we doing? How are we representing him? His reputation is on the line with us, with how we live in his world, with how we relate to one another, with how we care about what's happening in our world and how we're doing things to make a difference. We have the responsibility to communicate, to reveal God to our world. People are supposed to get to know what God is like by rubbing shoulders with us. We have a lifelong mission to get to know this infinite, amazing God and to follow in his footsteps. But we also have a huge responsibility for how we relate to one another. Male-female relationships in the church, and you know this because of your families, because of your own relationships, male-female relationships in the church are a disaster area. We don't know how to work together. There's tension among us. We have debates and fights over who can do what and who gets to be in charge. And we're not focusing on God and what he is calling us to be and do. He calls us to be one. He tells us we need each other. 
It's not about making room for someone so they'll feel better about themselves. It's because we need what they have, the gifts that God has entrusted to them. And we have a responsibility for how we communicate to the world something vastly different about how men and women work together. This generation can change things. My generation isn't doing that. And we need help with how to overcome the obstacles that the enemy has injected between us in our relationships. We have responsibility for how we represent God. We have responsibility for how we relate to one another and work together. But we also have responsibility for Marika and the millions of others like her. Sex trafficking, honor killings, female gender side, gang rapes, child marriages, fistula, child deaths and childbirths, the list goes on and on and the numbers are absolutely staggering. Journalist uh, Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun, who are authors of another book called Half the Sky, where they chronicle what's happening to women in the world, they are saying this is the paramount moral challenge of the 21st century, and it is rampant in our world. Whatever we may say about what the kingdom of God is like, it is not like what these women are experiencing. And it's our responsibility to do something about that, for we are God's image bearers. We are Azer warriors, and we are the blessed alliance he calls into action for his kingdom. The cries of the poor, of the oppressed, the powerless, and the trafficked are falling on our ears. And let me be clear, this is not just a mercy ministry. This is a recruitment effort. For if you read your Bible carefully, you will see that God is recruiting prostitutes and the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized and the nobodies to have strategic kingdom purposes for his, for his cause. So it's not just mercy, it's recruitment. It's for our sakes that we rescue, that we work to help them. And so as God's image bearers, as Azer warriors, as the Blessed Alliance, we have another question we need to ask. And that is, what will we do? May God help us to rise up and answer that question. Thank you.